Previously, we examined the Prophet ﷺ in the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. The Prophet ﷺ spent some seven months in the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari before moving out of the house. Now, one of the significant events that happened in Medina in the second year of the Hijrah, so about a year and a few months after the Prophet arrived, the city of Medina was the most sacred marriage that occurred in the history of humanity. And that's the marriage of Imam Ali and Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam at this point was about 24 years old. Whereas Lady Fatima alayhi salam was around nine years old. So according to most historical accounts, that say she was born five years after the Ba'tha of the Prophet that makes her around nine or ten years old when the Prophet came to Medina in the second year of the Hijrah. In the second year of the Hijrah, she was around nine or ten years old. Now previously, if you remember, we examined that in the past it was very normal, very common for women to marry at the age of nine, ten, eleven or twelve. And the greatest factor that led to such a young age of marriage was what? Death. If you remember, Death. life expectancy. In the past, life expectancy was not as long as it is today. Today here in the West, the average life expectancy is 77 years. That wasn't the case historically. The average life expectancy in a lot of eras was 30 years old, 40 years old, maximum 50 years old. That was the average. In many parts of Europe that was the case. In fact, if you go back some, uh, um, I would say 800, 900 years ago to England, modern day England, there was a point when the average life expectancy was 34 years old. That means if you pass 34, you turn 35, you were lucky. You're like a person today who goes into his 80s, right? That was the life expectancy. So now if you tell a woman, okay, start marrying at the age of 20, 25 today. Today Americans at what age do they get married? 25? Get married at age 25, 30. That means you've got three, three years left. Four years left to have kids. Sorry, if you don't, you're going to die. You're not going to have children. You're not going to see your grandchildren. They would have been denied the opportunity of seeing their family, of raising a family. This was a very fundamental point that made most societies throughout history go with a very young age of marriage. And Islam did approve of that. As long as the girl is physically mature, then she can get married. Now yes, there is one concern. A girl who's 10, 11, 12, 13 may not be mature enough to decide what's good for her. The one who's proposing, the potential suitor, is he good for her or not? How did Islam address that? This is one fundamental reason why Islam imposed the permission of the father, or if he's not alive, the grandfather, or the guardian. She has a guardian. The guardian must give permission, must give consent to the marriage. Why? To be uh, controlling? No but basically to make sure that the one who's marrying his daughter is suitable for his daughter. His daughter is not being exploited or taken advantage of because a 10 year old girl can easily be taken advantage of and exploited. But if you have the father's permission, that significantly minimizes that happening because a father in most societies it loves his daughter. He wants the best for her. So, Islam did recognize this young age and Lady Fatima السلام, according to most reports was 9, 10, some say 11, but somewhere in that age range. Now the date of the marriage according to most sources, the wedding took place in the first few days of the Hijjah, that's the 12th month in the lunar calendar in the second year of the Hijrah, but a lot of uh, sources indicate the marriage contract took place a few days before in the month of Dhul Qa'dah, yes. 
You mentioned Imam Ali was like 24. He was 23, 24, yes. So how come the men took long? Because Prophet Muhammad was a little bit older too when he got married. When he got married. Yeah, how come they were waiting if the life expectancy was not very long? Why were the men would be waiting, right? The primary reason, especially with Imam Ali السلام, even this applies to the Prophet Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, his circumstances in Mecca did not allow him to get married. They were in the state of persecution. The Imam was always, his priority was to defend the Prophet, to be with the Prophet. And the Imam السلام, was financially poor. He couldn't afford marriage. And remember in Mecca, Quraysh in that society, it was a very materialistic society. If you did not have money, if you were not wealthy, the prestigious families would not even look at you. In fact, if you remember from last year when we discussed the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ to Lady Khadija, Lady Khadija was rebuked by the women of Quraysh. They went to her, they told her, you married Muhammad who grew up an orphan and he's poor? Why did you do that? They were observing the marriage of the Prophet to Lady Khadija from a materialistic lens. And yeah, materialistically didn't make any sense. So Imam Ali السلام, first of all, his conditions were not conducive to getting married due to the excessive persecution in Mecca. Number two, he was poor. So he really didn't have the means to get married. Because Abu Talib, his, his father, when he was alive, he was sponsoring so many people. And the pro Abu Talib had made it a priority to spend his money on the Prophet So Imam Ali had to make that sacrifice. <coughs> Yes. During the years of Shia Abu Talib, didn't the Quraysh ban marriage to Madam Hashim? No one can marry their son. Yes, that was part of the boycott. During those three years of the Shia of Abu Talib, when the three years the Bani Hashim were boycotted, the Quraysh of Mecca, they imposed an embargo, a boycott. Part of the terms of that boycott was that no one can marry them. Both sides. Yes, both sides. There is no intermarrying with the Bani Hashim. Yeah, so they were really excommunicated in Mecca. So these are a number of factors why Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, uh, waited that long. Of course, there's a divine factor. He was waiting for Lady Fatima السلام, because we'll see this was an arranged marriage, but not in the negative sense of the arranged marriage. It was arranged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll, we'll discuss that. So... The wedding itself took place in the early days of the Hajjah, but the marriage contract, according to many sources, uh, took place a few days before in uh, the Qa'dah. Now the Prophet ﷺ, when he arrives Medina, he's the most important man in Medina. He has the greatest status, he's the Prophet of God, he becomes the leader of the community in Medina. And now he had a daughter who was of age, 10, 11, she could get married. It was natural that companions would come to the Prophet and propose. And in fact, we see a number of companions, well-known companions, they go to propose to the Prophet Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi, he mentions, he's a prominent Sunni scholar, he mentions a hadith, he says according to the standards of Bukhari and Muslim, this is a Sahih hadith, but they decided not to mention it. But it's a Sahih Hadith according to their standards. He says, this Hadith says that Abu Bakr went to the Prophet and he proposed. He said, I am come to ask for the hand of your daughter Fatima. According to this version of the Hadith, the Prophet said, she's too young. So he went back, Omar asked him, what did the Prophet tell you? The Prophet, uh, Abu Bakr said, the Prophet told me she's too young. Omar told him he rejected you. That's a nice way of rejecting you. Abu Bakr told him, okay, why don't you go and propose? So Omar goes and he proposes to the Prophet. The Prophet tells him the same thing. The Prophet tells Omar that she's too young. So he goes back to Abu Bakr and he tells him, Abu Bakr tells him, and he rejected you as well. So there are clear Sunni sources that Omar and Abu Bakr did propose, they were one of the first to propose, but the Prophet ﷺ rejected that. Ahmad ibn Hanbal also narrates some of these incidents. So these aren't hadith that we have in our sources only, these are hadiths that all Muslims have um, narrated. But there was also hadith that she was 19 when she was married. Between the, the Sunnis have narrated, yes. 19 
More, most, we, we examined her age uh, in our class last year when exactly she was born. Most Sunnis, they said that she was born five years before the birth of the Prophet. That makes her 10 years older. So at this time she would be, you know, 18, 19. So according to our sources from the Ahlul Bayt, which say she was 18 when she was martyred, that would make her uh, around 10 years old when she got married. So this is something disputed by historians, but this is the main position of the Ahlul Bayt school of thought, that she was young, she was 9 or 10. And remember, and historically this was common, Lady Maryam Lady Maryam when she, according to our Muslim sources, when uh, she became pregnant with Isa, she was 10 years old. Yes, she was 10 years old. Christians say she was 13, 14, but our four sources say she was 10. So now, Going back to our discussion, Omar and Abu Bakr, they come to, they propose. The Prophet he apologizes. We also have sources indicating that Abdul Rahman ibn Auf also proposed, but he was also rejected. Why did the Prophet reject? Because these companions in the end, socially speaking, they were prominent individuals. They came from Quraysh, especially Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, he came from an important family, why did the Prophet reject them? In reality, if we examine sources, historical sources, the rejection did not come from the Prophet The rejection came from who? Allah. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who rejected. In fact, there are hadiths that these suitors, you know, these people who proposed, they objected to the Prophet. So Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? We come, we propose, you keep rejecting us, what's the matter? The Prophet ﷺ would tell them, I'm not the one who rejected you. Allah is the one who rejected you. Simple as that, I'm just following the, uh, uh, you know, the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find what's unique about the marriage of Imam Ali and Fatima is that it was by God's intervention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to intervene. And in the tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad, it's a Sunni source, he says when Abu Bakr proposed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly told him, Ya Abu Bakr, antadhru biha al-qadha, I'm waiting for the judgments of Allah to come. This is something that Allah is going to decide, not me. Then the hadith continues that, you know, he said the same thing to Umar. So this is something that clearly was decided by Allah. That's the first reason why the Prophet rejected, because it was Allah's decision. The second reason, none of those who came to propose were a match for Lady Fatima. That's the reality. And that's why Allah had to intervene. They were not a match to Lady Fatima. In fact, there's a hadith which is accepted in our sources. There are some Sunni sources for, his, for it too, such as the book Kunuz Al-Haqa'iq by, by Al-Manawi. And also Ibn al-Maghazili, a Sunni scholar, he mentions this. The Prophet in this hadith says, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not created Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima alayhi salam would not have had a match. She couldn't marry anyone who was her match, who was with her status. That's the real reason that Allah rejected. Because none of those companions were a match to Lady Fatima Thirdly, the Prophet clearly states, he clearly implies and hints that others are not qualified. I'll share with you a few of those sources. A number of historians have documented that when Ali السلام, finally came and he proposed to the Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ told him, Hiya laka ya Ali. Yes, Fatima, you can marry her. For those who know Arabic, what does this phrase mean? You're not, well, be more specific. What does a Dajjal mean? No, 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 not that Dajjal, the linguistic meaning. Crook. Imposter. Which means Abu Bakr and Umar. Well, I'm not making a judgment here. <laughs> when he comes and proposes finally, the Prophet says, Yes, Fatima, you can marry. Then he says, You're not a Dajjal. You're not bad. 
You're not an imposter, you're not a crook. <coughs> Question, why, do the, why does the Prophet say this? <laughs> what is he implying? You be the judge, I'm not making any judgments here. By the way, Sunni sources have mentioned this hadith. For example, Ibn Sa'd and his tabaqat, Majma' al-Zawa'id by Haythami, these are Sunni scholars who've narrated that this is what the Prophet said to them. So I said to Imam Ali Now because Ibn Sa'ad and others, they were presented with a dilemma. This is a clear implication that those who had proposed before are Dajjals, right? So do you know how they justify it or how they uh, interpret it away? Ibn Sa'ad and others, they're like the Prophet didn't tell him Lasta bidajjal. They change a voweling. The Prophet said, less to be Dajjal. The Prophet said to Imam Ali, see in Arabic, Lasta means you're not. Less to, it's the same uh, word, but it depends on how you put the haraka on it. If you say less to, it means I'm not. Makes a difference. I'm not. So Ibn Sa'ad is like, no, 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 the Prophet didn't say, Lasta, you're not a Dajjal. He said, I am not a Dajjal. Well, why would the Prophet say that? No, they have a reason why they say that. They're like, the Prophet had promised Ali to give him Fatima. So when Imam Ali came and he proposed, the Prophet says, look, I'm not a Dajjal. I don't deceive you. I'm not an imposter or a crook. I'm true to my word. I'm true to my oath. We have an oath that you take Fatima? Here. Now, I'm fulfilling the oath. I am not a Dajjal, take her. This is how they had to explain the hadith because they had no way out. What are you going to do? It's a hadith that's found in our sources. But this way of explaining the hadith is problematic. Why? First of all, there are other sources that indicate the Prophet was referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib For example, one of these sources is mentioned by Uqayli a Sunni scholar, he mentions a hadith, he says, When the Prophet had her marry Imam Ali السلام, the Prophet said, The Prophet said, I have married you off to someone who's not a Dajjal. So based on this second account, when the Prophet says, you are not a Dajjal or I'm not a Dajjal, which, which version is it then? When the Prophet clearly in this hadith, he says to Fatima, I married you to one who's not a Dajjal. That means he's referring to himself or Imam Ali. Imam Ali alayhi salam. And that explains the first hadith very clearly. That when the Prophet says, lest be Dajjal, it was lest not lest to ana. That's one piece of evidence. Secondly, if you promise someone, there's an agreement, okay that inshallah when my daughter is of age, you can marry her and then the person comes and let's say you want to say no. Do you become a Dajjal? Imposter? What kind of a word would the Prophet be using if that's what he meant? Okay, the most thing that we'd have said, I'm some, so, someone who didn't honor his word. <coughs> that's the most that you would say, but the word Dajjal, that's too much. Doesn't fit with the language of the Prophet. Number three, <coughs> when did the Prophet make that promise to Imam Ali? In fact, Sunni sources indicate there was no such promise. I'll share with you one source. One source states that when the Prophet rejected those companions, specifically Umar and Abu Bakr, a number of them, they came to Imam Ali They told him, Ali, why don't you go and propose? Propose. They knew that the Prophet would only give her to Ali ibn Abi Talib. It seems they kind of figured that out. So they went to Imam Ali. like, Ali, why don't you go propose? According to Sunni sources, the Imam Ali, the Imam Ali salam told them, the companions, he's like, great idea. That never occurred to me. It never occurred to my mind that I should go and propose. There was no fact before. So if Imam Ali is saying in their sources, it never occurred to me, where was that prior agreement? For the Prophet to say, no, no, I'm not a Dajjal, let's honor that agreement. What agreement? There was no agreement. There was no agreement. And if there was agreement, why the other uh, companions would come and ask? And if there was a clear agree agreement, exactly, why would the other companions come and ask if there was such an agreement? And 
If there was an agreement when the Prophet rejected them, why did he say she's young or I'm waiting for Allah to give his decision? He could have just told them, hey, someone else has proposed, there is an agreement, it's a done deal. That's it, that's the best way to not reject them because that way you're not rejecting them really, right? You're just saying someone else is uh, already made an agreement, we've made an agreement with someone else. The Prophet didn't say that, so there was no prior agreement. In any case, this is a hadith that states the Prophet said to Imam Ali now you can marry Lady Fatima you're not a Dajjal, you're not an imposter.